Hello, Ave Maria, everyone. Welcome to this new Tea with Mary uh, show, Tea with Mary Catechesis 158. Today we uh, are very pleased to have a special guest with us, Father Thomas Screen, a Dominican father from London. Welcome, Father Thomas. Thank you, Father Serafino. Very nice to be here. Nice to see you, Father. And uh, normally we say cheers because we have some tea, but I gather that Father Thomas hasn't had his, uh, hasn't his uh, cup of tea. And uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, we have some tea. My Father Thomas may have some virtual tea. And uh, we, op uh, we start now this, I hope, interesting discussion on... Uh, on the synod, on synodality. Before we start uh, this discussion, we want to say a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Mother of the Church. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So again, thank you, Father, for being with us. And we greet all people at home who are watching this show and those people who will watch it later. The topic we want to discuss in this uh, Tea with Mary is the Synod, the ongoing Synod on Synodality. Uh, we, we have already uh, discussed this topic in other catechesis, but today with the help of Father Thomas we try to unpack this, uh, this topic and to see some difficult issues around it. To start, we should say that uh, we are experiencing a complete new uh, mentality around the Synod, a new will in the Church to uh, celebrate the Synod not only as a gathering of bishops with the Pope to discuss some important uh, issues for the Church at this time, and uh, also to let the bishops advise the Pope on very important, crucial issues for the Church in this time. But the Synod is conceived rather as uh, a new identity of the Church. Uh, the Synod has been given a constitutive identity for the Church, and this is very, very surprising. Uh, the, the, the Synod seems to be in some way the new identity of the Church. And the Synodal process, as a long process, an ongoing process, we have seen that in order to come to this Roman stage, the Synod started a few years ago, the discussion and uh, the, the amount of problematics discussed and also the very delicate uh, problematics which have been discussed uh, throughout these years in order to come to this Synod, let us think that the Synod is aiming at uh, creating a new, a new identity for the Church, which is something very surprising and, of course, it is something... Uh, uh, putting in a new vision of the Church, which is not acceptable. So, Father Thomas, what do you think about this uh, image, this new identity, uh, this synodal identity? What's, what's your take on it? Well, it feels rather like a war of attrition. Uh, it reminds me a bit of the, uh, the situation in the First World War. We have two sides in the trenches and um, the uh, the battle just seems to go on forever and ever. This is how a bit how I feel with the the synodal process, uh, and it's not just, of course, being being this synod, but um, 
these synods have been going on uh, in this very um, public way and raising every time all kinds of uh, expectations of dramatic changes in church doctrine and practice. Um, they've been going on for about 10 years. Um, we've had extraordinary synods and ordinary synods, and we've had synods uh, becoming double synods, uh, as this one, which was this one on synodality, which was originally just going to be one synod. And now I believe it's going to uh, take place next year as well, in the second session. And it all feels rather, as I say, like a war of attrition and an attempt to wear down the, the resistance to dangerous novelties by just uh, accustoming people to them, by repeating them over and over again. So, for example, something like you know, homosexual blessings, blessing for homosexual couples. Uh, so, you know, 10 years ago, no, I think no churchman would have been openly uh, recommending these things. Um, maybe just a few extreme theologians, uh, but by dint of, of repeating them, repeating these ideas over and over again, and gradually making them more and more mainstream, then it all feels rather like, as I say, a, a long drawn out war, which is aiming to, to wear out the opposition. Father, I can't hear you. All right, Father. I think you can hear me now. I can hear you now, yes. Yes. And uh, what I was saying is that uh, uh, we were speaking about this uh, process, synodal process, which seems to be to reconfigure the identity of the Church. Uh, and this is not acceptable. And uh, there was also... Uh, one of the dubia uh, submitted by the cardinals to the Holy See and to the Pope himself was pointing out this danger. To be precise, it was the third dubium uh, about the assertion that synodality is the constitutive element of the Church. Well, if, if this is the case, if synodality is the constitutive element of the Church, it means that the Church is no longer hierarchical, constituted on the foundation of Peter, who is the, the foundation, the, the rock of the Church, and the College of the Apostles, but it is rather constituted on, the, on this uh, process, on this synodal process, which seems to be something making the Church from below, from the consensus of the people, what the people want, what the people want to suggest, that is to be taken into account, to be discussed. And finally, if it is convenient, uh, it, to, be, to be also approved. But this, this is dangerous because it may change. Not the Church, because the Church is uh, infallibly uh, constituted on Peter and the Twelve Apostles, but it may change the, and the, the perception of the Church in the faithful. And uh, this is, I think, the risk. Uh, uh, that the, the Synod seems to, uh, uh, to, to wish uh, to change the Church uh, in the perception, in, the, in what the faithful have to understand. Because if this is a new understanding, if the, 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 the Synod comes as a new understanding of the Church, it is easier to push in uh, new doctrines or new pastoral uh, changes, because the Church is synodal and anything new, anything 
which seems to be uh, against the doctrine, should also be accepted. And uh, sh shall we, Father, speak about this, the importance of this uh, five, five dubia by the cardinals? And as this was about synodality, but there are also uh, some others very important pointing out the, uh, the, um, the fact that, for example, a revelation cannot be changed. A revelation is accepted by God and cannot change according to the time, according to the, the, the zeitgeist, this spirit of the time, and so on. Do you want? Do you want to tell us about the importance of this dubia? Yes, that's the. I think the first of the dubia submitted by the cardinals. It was really the cardinals asking the Pope to to reaffirm the the unchangeability of divine revelation. Uh, that we have the faith once for all given to the saints, as Saint Jude says, or um, and as the First Vatican Council defined, that we can't reinterpret dogmas once they've been defined and give them a, a different meaning uh, in accordance with the progress of real or supposed progress of, of human knowledge. So this is a very important uh, point, and it's really been one of the great points at issue in the Church for a long time now, but the, the cardinals have, have brought it to a head in a way by by making it one of their dubia. Um, and I have to say, I find the, the reply uh, very uh, well, confused in some respects um, and concerning in others. So the reply is divided into um, seven, I think, or eight points, little paragraphs, and one of them does uh, reaffirm the principle that divine revelation is immutable and always binding, which is good. Uh, but another point um, talks about having to distinguish in the texts of scripture and the testimonies of tradition between their perennial substance and their cultural conditioning. And that's, uh, I would say, an alarming statement because in the texts of scripture and the definitions of the uh, church councils, precisely what we have are things which are, are from God. So scripture is entirely inspired. And the definitions of the church councils, as I, as I mentioned, are to be retained in exactly the same sense in which they were, they were meant when they were defined. We don't have to strip away uh, a supposedly, supposedly uh, outmoded uh, cultural part of them from their inner core, and then we just take them as they are. Uh, and so uh, that reply to the dubia, to the first of the five, the first of the dubia, um, certainly calls for some kind of uh, some kind of clarification at the least. Yes, Father. What is very striking uh, while reflecting on these uh, synodal attempts to push in new doctrines. In fact, there are new doctrines here at the stake under the guise of pastoral care, pastoral uh, attitude towards people, not to let them feel abandoned or rejected. The problem is that, for example, when it comes to the blessing of homosexual couples, uh, now, the answer of the Holy See and the Pope, maybe the Pope himself, uh, to, the, to the dubia, to the one of these uh, five dubia, uh, saying that the Church cannot bless sin, basically, because it is against God's creation to bless uh, homosexual couples, not because we want to reject uh, the people, we hate the people, we are homophobous and so on, no, but because this is not what God has made when he created man, male and female. And Jesus is pointing to the principle, uh, to that principle of creation, when God made man, male and female. Now, uh, by uh, authorizing a blessing of these couples, homosexual couples in the church, in fact, we are, we are trying 
in some way, though indirectly, uh, though in a, in a veiled manner, we are saying that what God has done is wrong. We should do something different. We should try to correct that lack of mercy in God's creation. And uh, this seems to that we men, we people of the church, church men, want to do something now new and, uh, and in fact trying to do something against God. But this is not what the church can do, isn't it? Well, absolutely. And um, the, the idea that uh, a, a bishop or a priest can uh, you know, bless two men who present themselves as a couple is just obviously um, unacceptable. Uh, it's the, the idea that you can do this while still safeguarding the church's teaching on uh, on marriage and on chastity and on homosexuality and other sins against chastity uh, is just obviously um, untrue. And I don't think uh, that anybody who is willing to uh, look at things honestly, I don't see anybody who is willing to look at things honestly can really think otherwise. Um, and the the reply to the dubia, uh, like uh, uh, the first, like in the first reply, remains rather ambiguous. Uh, no doubt, as a uh, part of a general uh, rhetorical style, that's deliberately uh, deliberately being adopted. Um, but um, what we have to consider is not so much the uh, the meaning of the words in themselves, but the the effect of speaking these words uh, and of giving this this particular reply to a, a very simple question that has a very simple answer. Uh, and so, by not giving the the correct simple answer. Uh, in practice and in the, in the actual world in which people live, uh, a door is, has been opened to this, this very dangerous uh, practice of, of blessing people in so-called homosexual unions. Um, and so this is a, a very grave situation in, in the church that we're in. And when the faculty, Father, is given to each priest, basically, to discern whether it is opportune or not to bless, in order to avoid, because the answer was about avoiding any confusion between a marriage, between the only marriage, which is between man and woman, and any other union between two men or two women and so on. But as cardinals point, as the five cardinals pointed out in their reply to the first uh, dubia submitted, uh, the point was not about creating confusion at all. The point is that we cannot bless something different from God's creation, which has been uh, ratified by Jesus Christ in the gospel, pointing to the same principle of Genesis. So it's about God's will, God's creation in Genesis, in the, in the gospel, uh, and so on. So uh, the danger is that with this new language and this new response, uh, which seems to favor this blessing, though where there is no confusion, in fact, the, the blessing is allowed, so we can bless sin, and uh, the dubia is not resolved, but it creates ambiguity and uh, it creates also confusion in the church, a kind of schism, if we want. I don't know, this is my question to you. Do you think that we can, we may face a schism if the synod, as it seems, will approve a document uh, and also endorsed by Pope Francis to allow, say, uh, any priest to discern whether to bless or not an homosexual couple, to allow in a diocese the ordination of women to the diaconate, and to allow, we should say, also taking into account the, also the answer given by Fernandez, Archbishop Fernandez, to Cardinal Duca of Prague, 
to allow uh, communion to divorcees who uh, don't want to live as brothers and sisters, sisters, but to allow it only where it is there is a bishop favorable. Does this not lead to a schism? So to have the same diocese where a parish will bless an homosexual couple and the next door parish will refuse it. Well, we'll have to have to see how it plays out, but I don't see how a how a, a priest can continue to um, remain uh, subject to a, a bishop who is uh, explicitly uh, authorizing the blessing of sin, for example, uh, as as we're already seeing in in some parts of the world, in, in Belgium, for example. I mean, how how as a priest could you remain uh, as the priest of a diocese where the head of that diocese is um, explicitly saying um, uh, yes, blessing homosexual couples can be a good idea, and it's up to you in particular circumstances to discern whether to do it, just as it's up to you in particular circumstances to discern whether uh, an engaged ordinary couple real uh, couple is, is ready for marriage. Um, so a bishop who's, who's going that far, who's, who's explicitly saying that, um, and it just seems to me to have uh, departed from the Catholic faith, so I don't see how a, a priest can remain, remain subject to him. Uh, it's perhaps more likely that, um, that only a very few bishops will, will go that far, and uh, a greater number will just remain in ambiguity. Uh, I mean, that's what we've seen in, in past times in, in crisis in the church. Um, we've seen uh, the famous comparison is with the Arian, uh, Arian crisis of the fourth century. Uh, not all the creeds that, that were promulgated at that time were heretical, even when they were promulgated by, by people who were, in fact, Arians at heart. Uh, many of them were designed to be ambiguous and to try to to lull the faithful into a false sense of security. Uh, and it seems to me quite likely that that we're heading for more of that. Yes, with this ambiguity. Uh, there is also among the, uh, the, the questions raised by the dubia of the cardinals, the fact that uh, the possible uh, ordination of women, uh, the role of women in the church. The discourse starts with the fact that women have not to be neglected, their role must not be ignored. And now I just read a statement by Cardinal, Cardinal Hollerich, who is a prominent now organizer and uh, relator at this synod, who, according to him, since we all receive the baptism, we can never discriminate women in the church. So the baptism is the way for women and for anyone to have a role, to play a role in the church. And this seems the very first proposition of a syllogism aiming at one conclusion, that the women are equal to men and therefore women must be ordained to the sacred uh, perhaps for now to the sacred diaconate, uh, waiting for another time, and then when priesthood will be available for them. But again, Father, this is a problem. The problem is that the Catholic faith has a definitive doctrine on the ordination of women. And John Paul II confirmed this authentic, ordinary teaching, which is definitive, is infallible, cannot be uh, changed, because the church has no power to ordain the women, uh, because, because this is Christ's will, Christ's institution of the sacrament of holy orders. But again, the synod tries, by the way of mercy and uh, pastoral care, uh, not to change the doctrine, but to change the perception of that doctrine, I think, in order to make that change available uh, in today's church, in today's society. But again, this is not, not possible. It is about changing Christ's institution, Christ's church. Can the synod 
try to do that? Is the synod allowed to do that? Well, of course, of course, it's not allowed, um, not allowed by God to do that. Uh, yeah, a couple of things come to mind there. One in regard to Cardinal uh, Hollerich's words about women are, are baptized, therefore we can't uh, exclude them from anything in, in the church, implying therefore also from priesthood. Well, that's just a sort of childish sophism, if I may say so. Uh, the fact that women are baptized just means that we can't exclude them from anything that derives from baptism, any of the rights or duties that derive from baptism. Uh, but being ordained is not one of the rights or duties that derive from baptism. So the fact that women are ordained, uh, are baptized is just irrelevant. Um, so, so much for that. Um, and then on regard to the, the church's doctrine about ordination being by the will of Christ uh, reserved to men, uh, it's, as you say, that's a, a definitive statement. John Paul II uh, taught it in a crystal clear, definitive way in um, Ordinatio Sacerdotalis in the 1990s, uh, putting an end to any any possible doubt. Um, unfortunately, in the, the reply to the, the dubia of the five cardinals, there's a, there is an attempt uh, to put that into doubt and to say uh, that we don't really know what a definitive statement means. That, that this whole idea of definitive statements is terribly confusing and what do they actually mean? Now, and the claim is made that they just mean that we can't contradict, contradict them in public, but that's not what anybody is, what anybody has ever understood definitive statements to mean. They are, uh, definitive statements are just what they say. They're definitive statements. They, they put an end, a finis, a definitive uh, to the discussion. Um, and, um, if they weren't, then then we wouldn't be able to have any certainty about uh, the, uh, the the faith at all, uh, because you would need a you know, another definitive statement to tell us what definitive statements were, and then uh, we'd need another statement to uh, decide whether or not that definitive statement had really been definitive, and so on, ad infinitum. Um, so again, I, I don't I don't think that the synod is likely to come up with clear statements saying women must be ordained, women can be ordained, uh, because clear statements are just not the modus operandi. Uh, but it's likely that there'll be some kind of language encouraging that hope and some kind of uh, opening of doors to do things that look like having women as priests. For example, saying that they can uh, assist the priest during the Eucharistic prayer, maybe that's just one example. Uh, and maybe those women who are going to be assisting the priest during the Eucharistic prayer could wear some kind of uh, uh, garment that shows what their role is. And that garment uh, might turn out to look very much like a deacon stole or something like that. I don't want to say more because I might give them ideas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing that could happen. Yes, Father, let me play the devil's advocate here, yeah? yes. just to see whether there could be a kind of uh, harmful uh, outcome. But what about if a bishop, in light of the synodal discussion and possible final documents approval, will, for example, go ahead with the ordination of a woman to the diaconate? Is that schismatic? Um, yes, yeah, surely that's a schismatic act. Uh, I mean, it's well, it's a it's an heretical act. It's embodying a, her a heresy, uh, I would say. Uh, I mean, it'd be clearer if they tried to ordain a woman to the priesthood. Uh, the, um, so, because it has been that, that clearer, uh, that definitive statement by John Paul II about the impossibility of, of women being ordained to the priesthood. Uh, he, he didn't choose to mention the diaconate in that letter. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I would certainly say that a, a bishop who did that would be a bishop who should be should be avoided uh, because he's clearly uh, trying to break down, in effect, in, in as far as lies in him, he is breaking down the constitution of the church. It's, it's true. What Cardinal Olerich uh, let me remember when he said that about the baptism, which is equal for everyone, was an heretical monk 
of the fourth century, during the time of Saint Jerome, Jovinian, who was uh, preaching basically that uh, there is no difference in heaven between those who are baptized, uh, lay people, and those who are consecrated virgins, because the baptism is the only pledge of eternal life. So what's the difference between a lay person, lay woman, so to say, and a religious consecrated woman? No difference. So what's the conclusion? Better to abolish religious life, because lay, uh, the, the marital life is higher than marriage, and, and the consecrated virginity is, is uh, void of any, uh, of any uh, meaning for eternity. Saint Jerome fought against this heretical bishop trying to undermine the virginity, the consecrated virginity, and therefore the virginity of Our Lady, because the very target was Our Lady's perpetual virginity, higher to any other state of life. So there is always this attempt in the name of baptism to level any distinction in the Church. And, uh, but we have, of course, to rebuke this kind of attempt, starting from a false premise to draw, of course, a false conclusion from this discourse. So, just to say that attempts of this kind have been already made in the Church, in also in, uh, in other times, but Father, there is another, another aspect which is worth discussing, I think, and this is the continuous reference to the Holy Spirit. I think that the Synod seems to be the most inspired process in the Church, even more than the Bible in some way. <laughs> Everything is the Holy Spirit, and every time they gather, I think they say there is an they had an, an, a great experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit. My fear, and uh, I, this is also my question to you, to, to know what you think. My fear is that it is the Synod, uh, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, rather than the Holy Spirit ensuring that at the Synod there is His holy guidance and protection in order to, to get to a Catholic point and to teach Catholic doctrine, the synod as expression of the presence of the Holy Spirit, the synod uh, in some way uh, giving the Holy Spirit, is this the case? Yes, I think this is the same problem we were talking about before, the idea of, of ongoing revelation, uh, this idea that um, the Holy Spirit's uh, revelation of truth is uh, something that we that we that we are uh, not, that we are in need of, uh, and that it's the job of of everybody to get together and to try to discern um, the truths uh, about the moral law or about the constitution of the church that the Holy Spirit is supposedly uh, revealing to our age, and um, and this is just not Catholic because the Holy Spirit is not at work. To, to reveal new doctrines. This is uh, this, this was stated very clearly at the first Vatican Council when it was the uh, infallibility of the Pope that was being defined. And they made the point that the Holy Spirit is not given to the Pope to declare new doctrines, but to help him preserve that, that which has been revealed by our Lord to the apostles and handed down. And that's, that's true of, of all uh, legitimate assemblies in the church, whether it's a uh, an ecumenical council or a synod of bishops um, that they are there to help to preserve the truth that's been handed down and help help us Christians to conform our lives to that truth uh, but they're not they're not there to um, invoke the Holy Spirit to bring about uh, a new revelation uh, as if uh, as if revelation had not already finished with the death of the last apostle um, so the, these, that, that clear distinction is just um, one of the many victims of uh, this uh, synodal ambiguity that we've been talking about. Yes. Right, Father. There are some few questions now who have come in. I think it is time now to also open the discussion with the people 
following online. We thank them for being with us this afternoon. And uh, let's see the, f the questions arrived. I think there is Antonio P. Synodality is an illusion. The process is manipulated by liberals to ensure that their heretical views prevail. Well, there is a kind of uh, liberal influence in this. And another very interesting or surprising element in this synodal process, synodal gathering in Rome, is that in spite of this claim of being open synodal, uh, everything is very hermetic, Father Kareen. Uh, we don't know about what they say, what they discuss. We don't know about who are the members of the round tables, who is sitting with and who says uh, some, some something. So it's all kept very secret. Why? Yes, well, well why indeed? That's an important point. And that's not how uh, ecumenical councils, for example, uh, have proceeded down the ages. There have been, uh, there's, there have always been records kept of exactly who said what, and um, we can we can consult these records. So we uh, we have them back, as back as uh, as uh, far back as the Council of Ephesus. So we can go right back to the fifth century and see who said what at the Council of Ephesus, and so on with with later councils up to Vatican II. I believe the, the records of who said what were lost for the, the first two councils. Um, and that's very important because it's important for the faithful to know if their bishop is doing his job as a successor of the apostles, if he's being a faithful shepherd, and therefore he's, he's someone they can look up to as a father and, and respect and um, go to for his spiritual guidance, or whether he's... Uh, as has unfortunately happened in history, acting as a wolf, or whether he's perhaps acting as a hireling and um, not deliberately trying to corrupt the faith, but, but running away from challenges to it. So uh, that's why it's, it's very helpful for us to know uh, what's going on at any kind of uh, gathering of this nature. Yes, yes, true. Right, let's see Marco Fasoli, who is asking uh, Greetings to Father Serafino and Father Crean. In your view, how does the synodal process inaugurated in this pontificate differ from that of previous synods? And there is... Shall we answer first this one, Father Thomas? Is there any significant yes. difference? Well, there's, there's a great difference in the structure because as you mentioned uh, near the beginning this is not a synod of bishops anymore uh, this was a point that was made very uh, learnedly eloquently by father gerald murray uh, expert canon lawyer a week or two ago when he pointed out that there is such a thing as a synod of bishops and it's explained in canon law what its role is how it's constituted but that the assembly that's taking place in Rome at the moment is not that, because it's been uh, supplemented by all kinds of other members. And so it's, uh, in, in that respect, it's a sui generis assembly that doesn't seem to be uh, governed by the norms in canon law. So already there's, there's that question about what exactly is this assembly? Uh, so that's one of uh, Father Murray's important points. And then, um, there's the, the other point that, as you were saying, the idea of a synod is to help the, the Pope teach doctrine more clearly. Does the bishops bring to his attention the particular problems in their in their parts of the world? And they, they discuss with him about how in their different situations they can apply Catholic doctrine effectively. Um, whereas this synod seems to be, or this assembly seems to be presented as an attempt to, to just to discern what Catholic doctrine is, and there's no distinction really being made between the the charism of the bishops, the charism of truth that they have to expound um, uh, expound doctrine, and the grace of the faithful, the, the what we might call the simple faithful, non bishops, um, 
they have the grace to respond to the truth when it is preached what's sometimes called um, uh, infallibility in believing but the bishops have infallibility in teaching and the the church as a whole uh, has infallibility in, in believing so those who are faithful will be able to recognize um, the truth when it is taught to them but there seems to be an attempt to to give to everybody in the church uh, a share in the infallibility in teaching which is not something that's uh, grounded in, in Catholic faith or theology. Father Thomas, let me expand a little more on that because I think it is very important, very crucial. Uh, the, the sophism here behind this, this argument uh, is that uh, since the infallibility in teaching depends on the infallibility in believing, so uh, the sensus fidei of the faithful precedes the teaching uh, ministry of the church and of the bishops and that the synod is discovering something which is even more foundational than the teaching role of the bishops because it is highlighting the census fidei of all the faithful and uh, in light of the census fidei everyone is uh, uh, entitled in the church to say whatever he thinks and ask for for approving any any doctrine which seems to be to be something necessary for the times this is the ambiguity this is the i think the the, the point to answer correctly the census fide yes but the census fide is a manifestation of the infallibility of the church in believing when it is in conformity with god's revelation and it is not a reinterpretation of the revelation in light of today's uh, culture, today's ideologies, if we want. What's your take on it? Yes, the infallibility of the, the apostles comes before or came before the, um, the infallibility of the in believing of the, of the faithful whom they preached to and, and baptize. Otherwise, our Lord wouldn't have said, go and teach your nations, but go and, and meet as many people as you can and, and discern with them uh, to find out what I meant when I was with you. And that's not what he said. Now, our Lord could have, could have set up his church differently. He could have uh, set it up in, in a way that um, there was no distinction between the hierarchy and the simply baptized. He could have set it up with ongoing revelation, as the Mormons think. Uh, so there's a, a new uh, a new doctrine being revealed every few years. Um, but that's not how he set it up. And to find out how he set it up, well, we look at the, the tradition of the church, we look at the New Testament. And what we find in the New Testament is not a, uh, that kind of synodal church, but... Uh, and a church founded on the apostles, uh, and it's the bishops who are the successors of the apostles. Yes, so we cannot play with the word census fide as with the word synodality in order to change the identity of the church. Yes, the constitutive element of the church, which is hierarchical and not synodal. Uh, there is Arul John Bosco from, from India who asks, will this begin a new era in Catholic calendar like pre-post synod on, <laughs> on synodality, similar pre-post Vatican II? Well, it's an interesting point, I think, Father Green. Yes. Pre-Vatican II, uh, post-Vatican II, isn't it? I mean, I, I, would, I would think it probably won't in quite the same way. And I, I would say that uh, what we're, what, because of what we are, experiencing now is more of a just a, a new stage in the ongoing um, struggle really that's been going on in the church openly at least since Vatican II um, because what we what we're seeing today is is not really that new uh, when some some aspects of it are but uh, the, the attempt to create a new church 
uh, is very much found in um, some of those who who are who were speaking in the in the sixties and in the seventies, influential theologians, uh, uh, certain bishops. Um, so it doesn't seem to me to be uh, so much a uh, uh, an entirely new war, but rather a new battle in the same war. Yes. If, it is also true that uh, uh, in Pope Francis' view, uh, synodality is the right conclusion of collegiality, I think. It is a kind of practical conclusion of that permanent collegiality, which was failed at Vatican II in Paul VI's uh, Nota Previa at Lumen Gentium to explain what collegiality properly is and that there is not an ongoing indefinite collegiality in the Church. Collegiality is there only when it is called by the Pope and there is a collegial act. But that failure has in some way uh, been uh, uh, reshaped, if you want, and put into action with this uh, possible ongoing synodality to have a kind of uh, an expression of that permanent collegiality in the church but of course the church is not collegial and again the same argument uh, that we apply to collegiality we should also apply to to synodality synodality is not an ongoing manifestation that being together in order to decide what to do and to counter the supremacy of the Holy Pontiff in the Church, trying to put the College of Bishops on the same level of the primacy of Peter, and now putting the synod, synodal uh, collegiality in some way uh, on the same level as the Bishops' uh, College and the primacy of Peter. This is something which is not acceptable because it is destabilizing again uh, the the, the, the structure, the, the identity of the church. Right, uh, we have still some questions here. Francesca Di Fonso, uh, if I co correct understand, it is already grievous that it, as it has been lately, let alone if all this is past, very destab destabilizing and ambiguous. Uh, this something I, I uh, want to point out uh, uh, further and ask your opinion about it. Uh, the fact that, uh, quest uh, that doctrines which cannot be the object of discussions, such as women's ordination or blessing of something which is sinful in itself, have been discussed and they are put on the table of this synod. Is this not something very dangerous, something which is not acceptable from a Catholic point of view. We cannot discuss which is not a matter of discussion. Hey, uh, yes, exactly. And but this is very much the, the tactic of a certain kind of um, uh, what people call sort of euphemistically a, a progressive, uh, simply just as a heretic, but you can say progressive if you like, um, to to say something very extreme, who, which he knows will not be accepted immediately, but in order to create uh, a new center. And so you find this, the same process in, in, in the state. Um, and then people, when they wanted to create uh, marriage for homosexuals, say homosexual marriage, uh, they began by proposing it, and it, sounded, it seemed very extreme to everybody. Uh, and so some people came in with a a supposedly compromised position of a civil union, homosexual civil union. Uh, and then that compromised position becomes a new norm. And so um, you can gradually, in that way, um, by proposing something which is ever more extreme, gradually change people's perceptions of what the of what the norm is. And so they gradually become more and more ready to accept uh, things that they would never have accepted at the beginning. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's slightly gone off, off the tangent of the, the question that you originally asked. This is, I, yes, it, it is it is this one, because 
of course, with this discussion, they try to make the case for things which are not the object of discussion and to approve things which are not discussable at all. Yes. But yes. in my opinion, Father, this is this is unacceptable. This is not yes, Catholic yes. and they exactly. are not competent on discussing things which are not mm -hmm. object of discussion. Exactly. And once they're being put on the table and discuss as if they were, then in my opinion, the, the correct behavior for faithful bishops is not to say, well, I have another opinion and then carry on discussing. It's to stand up and say, this is completely unacceptable. This has to, your words have to be rejected. You have to, you have to uh, recall your words or else I'm leaving. And then just to walk out of the synod. And that, uh, that would be much more effective. Uh, and it would be a sign of, it would be much more encouraging for the faithful than just carrying on in a, in a sort of polite uh, discussion. Uh, as you say, discussing things that just can't be, can't be put on the table. Yes, yes. And this is very ambiguous and very dangerous for the time to come after the Synod, because if the Synod is authorized to discuss anything, of course, later in the Church, we can, we can put into doubt, into question anything. Uh, revelation as such. That's why the first dubia by dubium by the cardinals is very important. Revelation is not the object of our own interpretation or reinterpretation. Revelation is a gift coming from God and we welcome it. We do not discuss it. We do not uh, object to it. We, we accept it, mm -hmm. we believe it, and then we hand it on with the tradition of the church and we are faithful to its uh, to its transmission to its tradition in the church but uh, this is i think the main one of the main uh, very difficult uh, aspects of this synodal process mm, we have of course to trust god's mercy and uh, god's intervention to help our mother church not to be destabilized and uh, to remain what always the same let's see one maybe one more last before we come to conclusion father with a final prayer i think there is still miriam totil lucifer was not asked to serve the virgin mary because he was inferior to her but because god willed it and will and the will of god is paramount are women in the same position? <laughs> so it was God's will that Our Lady uh, could be even superior to, not by nature, but by grace, to the devil. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the point is God's will. Yes, and, and the hierarchy is not, a, is not an evil to be endured, but it's, it's part of the beauty of the church and there are, there are a variety of hierarchies, the, the, the hierarchy of, of the um, sacrament of orders, bishop, priest and deacon and the minor orders. Uh, and then there's the hierarchy of grace, which is, is the more important hierarchy. And that's the hier hierarchy at which Our Lady is, is, at, is at the head, is the most holy of, the, of pure creatures. Um, so we should we should we should as as catholics uh not um succumb to the uh the temptation to to respond to a word like hierarchy as if it was a a bad thing as if it was something to be ashamed of or to be something to be uh leveled as far as possible you know hierarchy is is part of god's plan for creation and, and um, as you say, it's our our task as creatures is to accept His will and to and to flourish by accepting it. Yes. Thank you. I think we have also the time to read one last question by Marco Fazoli, which I think it's very interesting. The last one: Whilst the Holy Spirit has no role in the definition of New Revelations doctrine. Would it not play a role in restraining the promulgation of errors, such as the ones being pushed by the current synod? 
Yes, uh, he he certainly does have a role because he is always living as the soul of the church, uh, and we can see that I would say even in the the answers to the the recent dubia, um, which uh, though I don't think are, are at all satisfactory. Uh, this unsatisfactoriness seems to me to take mostly the form of ambiguity rather than direct error. Um, but more importantly, perhaps uh, the Holy Spirit will always preserve the church in truth and will not allow uh, falsehoods to be defined as, as binding on Catholics or as conditions for us to be Catholics. Um, and he would also always raise up faithful bishops uh, and priests and laity, as we see him doing. But uh, that's not to say that things can't get very bad. Things can get very bad, uh, but we have to trust that uh, the church is always a city on, set on the hill that cannot be hidden, as our Lord said. And so for those who wish to see it, it would always be visible for them to see. Yes. So we cannot accept, basically, what it is, the manifesto, I think, of this uh, synodal process, that the synod itself is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. No, it is the Holy Spirit who is manifest when the synod embarks on something which is Catholic and uh, endorses Catholic teaching according to tradition. And the Holy Spirit, of course, can also let us be free. And even a pope, a bishop, is free in teaching. It's not forced by the Holy Spirit to say the truth. But the only safeguarded uh, moment of the Catholic teaching is when the Pope is teaching ex cathedra. There, there is the manifestation of the infallibility of the Pope. But uh, and yet the Pope himself and other bishops remain free in their obedience to the Holy Spirit. So it is rather uh, obeying to the Holy Spirit than being the voice of the Holy Spirit in any moment, in any particular situation, such as the Synodal Assembly. Right, Father Thomas, I think we have come to 6 p.m. and I know that you have now to go. And before you go, shall we say, we thank you for being with us, for helping us understand this difficult moment in the Church. We want also to reassure all the faithful to be strong in faith, and to be faithful to Mother Church, not to abandon Mother Church at this moment of great distress, but to pray, to do penance for the sake of the unity of the faith, the unity of the Church, because the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Would you, Father, lead us in prayer? We say the final Angelus, please. Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh. And dwelt amongst us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, the Holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. For forth we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you again, Father Thomas, for being with us, and we thank all the people at home for watching, and all the best, and God bless you all. Ave Maria. Bye, Father. Bye, everyone.